Shout amen. amen. Wherever you are tonight, the hearing of my voice. Something is about to happen to you tonight. God is about to change your life tonight. The name of Jesus is about to cause a revolution in you. Something that has been there a long time will suddenly vanish away. Whether you say amen or not, it will happen. <laughs> Why? Because we'll mention the name of Jesus. And wherever the name of Jesus is mentioned, something is there to happen. Somebody here mentioned that name. Jesus. Can you mention it with passion? Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Tonight, I'm talking about something I call life that satisfies. And I'm reading two long passages of scripture. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse number 4. And Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verse 12 to 18. John 1, 4 says, In him, Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of men. Amen. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 from verse 12 to 18 says, I the preacher was king over Israel in Jerusalem and I set my heart to seek and set out by wisdom concerning all that is done on the heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of men by which they may be exercised. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight and what is lacking cannot be numbered. I communed with my heart saying, look, I have attained greatness and have gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart has gathered great wisdom and understanding and knowledge. And I set my heart to know wisdom and also to know foolishness and madness. I perceive this also is grasping for the wind. For in much wisdom is much grief. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Let us pray. Everlasting King, righteous God, we bow before your throne as your people, your church, redeemed by the blood tonight. And Father, we are not coming because of our own merits or righteousness or goodness, but we are coming because of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray, O oh God, that the heavens will be open tonight. We pray that souls will be saved tonight. We pray that there will be salvation tonight. We pray that there will be healing tonight. We pray that them that are bound by the devil will be delivered tonight. Satan, I address you to your face. You have no power in this place. You have no unsubtle claim against any man. I bind you in the name of Jesus. I speak to every principality in this heavens, every throne, every dominion, Every Antichrist spirit, I bind you now in the name of Jesus. Every spirit of doubt and unbelief, I bind you in the name of Jesus. I release the spirit of repentance, salvation of souls, healing deliverance. In the name of Jesus, let there be liberty tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may give the Lord a clap of him as you sit. <laughs> Beloved, wherever you are, the hearing of my voice, I came to speak to you about life that satisfies. The subject I am talking about today is a very important one, life. Everybody shout and say life. life. 
Everybody shout and say life. Life, life is the most single person of all mankind. It has always been the preoccupation of scientists of all status, specifications, and pedigree to understand the mystery and existence and solve the riddle of life's uncertainty, but they cannot. Hallelujah. People of all classes and all places, all kinds of color, have a saying. And the saying is this life is not fair. Somebody shout and say, life is not fair. Life is not fair. But somebody says, it's fairness, the unfavorable. I believe in education. I believe in the training of the mind and the whole person. I believe that if a man has opportunity to be in a place like United Kingdom, especially coming from where I have come from, and can train himself up properly, there is no way he cannot have satisfaction in, in life. But I found out rather too late that that is not the case. Shout amen. amen. People strive to become the best in life. Best politicians, best scientists, best medics, great people. And they have all that people need in this life. They have money, they marry wives, and they leave some of them and they marry other ones. They have houses and cars of all colors. Yet their life is not satisfied. I'm preaching to people. I am preaching to people. I am preaching to people. There is a gentleman here in the Lord of God I love so much. And his name is Solomon. And I used to call him Solo. Hallelujah. The Bible identified this man in the book of Ecclesiastes only as the preacher. At a very tender age of 18, he inherited the most powerful and populous throne in his time, the throne of King David. And he extended the borders of the land he inherited 10 times. Shout amen. amen. Now, David left for his son a great kingdom, a great inheritance, a loyal people, great substance. He has stability in that community. Everything Solomon needed to continue in life, his father gave it to him. I'm preaching. And coupled to that, the Bible says, the almighty God blessed Solomon. He gave him such Powerful wisdom and understanding. So much wisdom and a large net of heart that the Bible said his wisdom is uncountable. It's like the sand of the shore. Wise King Solomon was a great philosopher. He was a scientist of no mean ability. He was the architect of the temple that was one of the wonders of the world. Solomon wrote his test. 400 years before the seven wise men of Greece ever started to write. Somebody shout and say, Solo. He set his heart to understand, to seek the riddles or the meaningfulness of life. And he said to himself, I will try to test everything under the sun. Can I go on? Can I go on? Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. As much as he was said to be wise, the Bible says Solomon became very foolish. Solo married 300 wives. And he had 700 girlfriends. I tell you, he tested women of all colors and shapes. Solomon sought the satisfaction of everything under the sun. I'm preaching. I am preaching. He saw satisfaction in science. He saw satisfaction in philosophy. He found pleasure in dreams and all vices, myths. He built edifices. 
He had great possession, wealth. He developed music. Solomon tried materialism of all sorts. I'm preaching. He tried fatalism, the belief that events are decided by faith and that you cannot control them. He tried deism, tested other gods and every object of worship. Let me tell you something. Cults did not start today. Solomon tested every one of it. I'm preaching to people. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. He tried natural religion to worship all kinds of things. He tested wealth and he tested morality. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 3 to 10, he said, I searched in my heart how to grow, gratify my flesh with wine while guiding my heart with wisdom and how to hear hold on the folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men to do on the heaven all the days of their life. Then suddenly, at a rather old age, Solomon came to himself. And he drew the conclusion of his life written thesis. And I want to read the conclusion of Solomon's thesis. Somebody asked me to read it. Yes. Solomon said, for the conclusion of the matter is this. Vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Hallelujah. Life, my friend, is meaningless and vexation of spirit. Life apart from God's life is weariness and disappointment. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? Not too long ago, we celebrated the death of somebody. People were weeping uncontrollably. But I came to tell you that the life of performing artists is just on platform. This is a life that has gone through pain and challenge. This is a life that was seeking the meaningness of the meaningness of life everywhere, but had no satisfaction. But I came to tell you tonight that there is somebody that can give you life. I'm talking about life that can satisfy, life that can change your life and turn it around about turn. You want to shout, Amen, do it. Hallelujah. Hear me, young people. In case you want to test these things in life, I came to suggest to you that somebody smarter than you has already tested it. And he has already drawn the conclusion. Let me suggest to you that the only unwise, he is only unwise who leads this life by test and pleasurable adventure. There are too many young people sitting before me right now who are daring to test everything under the sun. It is rather wise who will build his life on the experiences of others and test their discredit. Hallelujah. The statistics of young people ending their lives today is becoming um, alarming. Sometimes if you meet young people, they don't know what to do. They want to try everything. Listen, somebody has tried it for you. I'm preaching to somebody. You come into this place only for pleasure and adventure. Today, the psychiatrist coaches are full because of depression. People are committing suicide by each passing day. Am I preaching? Yes. A young lady, a musician, 26 years old, a manager in a company, walked to my room three weeks ago, drunk. In the middle of the night. And she said to me, can I, can I speak to Pastor Markey? I said, yes, madam. She said, I have come to the end of my life. I am 26 years old. Have everything that I need in life, but I'm not satisfied. And I want to end up my life today. 26 years old. Not too long ago, in the Ghanaian Daily Graphic, there was a publication of a young, brilliant medic. 
a urologist who wanted, who hung himself in his own bedroom in the teaching hospital. And he had wrote a note beside his bed. I am fed up with life. Life is not with living. I was privileged to have a tutor when I was in college, one of the best brilliant biology scholars trained from Germany. But yet, in the midst of his knowledge, trained, that man was a miserable drunkard and an addict. Many good young people come to university in this place only to have lives changed for evil out of curiosity. Their parents do not even know the things they are doing here, the things they go through. The question to ask is this, and you ask it all the time, is life worth living? I'm preaching. Amen. Today's philosophy encourages himself with the adage that life is how you make it. That is what they say. Life is how you make it. But that is another deception. Life's injustice often starts at birth, and it does not get any better with age. At 50, and he has not found a satisfaction, only pain and distress. I came to advocate to you, my friends, another life. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I came to advocate to you a life that satisfies a life that can take a grasp hold of you. A life that can change you. A life that can bring you meaning. A life that can transform you. A life that can bring you that satisfaction you need. Somebody shout and say life. life. Shout and say life. life. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, the Greek language from which the New Testament was written has much wider vocabulary than the English counterpart. For instance, when the Bible talks about life, there is one meaning to that word, there's more than one meaning to that word life. Life number one in the Greek, in the New Testament, is what the Greek calls anastrophe. It implies a confused life or behavior. For instance, it includes the life of a mentally retarded or one who has growth deficiencies, a person who is not properly developed in the mind and the stature. I happen to pray for a 17-year-old girl who lives with five-year-old people. He can only play with five-year-old people because he is retarded. He's, he was born like that. He cannot grow up. And sometimes in this place, when somebody is in this situation, they have to put you into a special class. But I came to tell you something, that there is only one life that can change that life. And we prayed for that young lady in the name of Jesus. Four years ago, I met her, I could not identify her. A secretary in her father's company. And she looked into my eyes and said, do you know me, sir? So you better remind me, lady. She said, I was a young girl you prayed for. And from that day that that kind of life came into my life, my life began to change. Yeah. Hallelujah! Yeah. They put you in a place somewhere, and they said, that is a special kid. He needs a special kind of training. He needs a special something. I came to tell you, you need another life. Am I preaching to people? Yes. I'm talking about life. The second one is what we call bios. Bios is living life. The instinct in any organism that makes him live, just like a tree or an animal or a man. It is out of this word that we have the word biology. Biology is two words put together. The first one is bios, and the second one is logos word. It means that it's a scientific study of life and structure of plants and animals. And it comes as a result of God putting his breath into man. 
Hallelujah. Now, no medical science has been able to discover the source of this life. I asked a brilliant young physician a question. What, as a physician, amazes you most among the human life after all these years of research and practice? And listen to what he said. He stood for a moment and said, how the human organs shut off and how life finally leaves it. Shout amen. amen. I said to him, I know how it all happens and I can tell you. He said, I studied it for several years. I don't know and you can tell me. And I said, yes, I can tell you. The Bible says, and God breathed into man and man became a living soul. Hallelujah. And so when that kind of life leaves that man, that person begins to die. That life is a biological life. The life that makes every man live. Shout amen. amen. But hear me folks, there is yet another kind of life. That life is the life we call suke, a manner of life that people receive. And that is what the world has specialized in. Hallelujah. Amen. That one it comes out of it's, uh, uh, words like psychology or psychiatry. They all come from that word. They train your mind to behave well. They train your system to adapt to certain situations. The Bible even says, train a child the way he should go. So that when he grows, he will not do what? Depart from it. But trust me, many people began in Sunday school. And by the time they are already in class six, they are worse than devils. Hello? And so training can always only make you good. Be adaptable to a society be able to go in and come out and they look at your face and say this guy is cultured he's good mannered somebody said and say suke hallelujah Amen. hallelujah Amen. you look a gentleman one of my friends said i am a good guy i said what makes you a good guy he said well i don't smoke i don't chase after young ladies i don't even gossip i am a good guy Shout amen. amen. There are many people who have never been to church before. And all these things we consider evil, they have not done it before. And so when you look at them and compare it with your life, you will ask yourself a question, where do I stand? I'm talking about life. They have the best of education. They have the best of place to live. Their manners are so astute and right. There is a gentleman in the Bible called Cornelius. In Acts of chapter 10, verse 1 to 10, I will read it briefly. It says, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Everybody shout and say always. Always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. Full stop. And then he said in verse 5, Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging with, a signer, with, with Simon Etana, whose house is by the sea. He will, te te he will tell you what you must do. Amen. There are very few people that can be described aptly like this man. Cornelius was a good man by all standards. And the Bible says he even prays to God always. Probably he prays three times, he prays four times, or he may even be praying five times a day. I'm preaching. Yes. He 
give arms to the people, probably to Africa and every other place. He's built mansions and he's built even houses of God. The Bible says, Cornelius was a good man and a man who feared God and very pious, very devoted. Goes to church every Sunday morning. Hallelujah. Amen. But all that the Bible had to say was that all the things that he was doing has only come as a memorial before God. Full stop. Cornelius has a good life. He has the bios and he has the suke. Everybody sees him as a good man. But God knows that Cornelius needs something more than that. I came to tell you that you need something more than good manners. Something that will give you a satisfaction. Something that will ride on. Hallelujah. Not a life that is hooked to painkillers. Cornelius probably attended church and gave his offering. He was satisfied. He has every need. But that life does not satisfy. But I came to advocate to you another life, which is the fourth life. Everybody shout and say life. life. And that is the life that satisfies. The Greek called is Zoe. Say it with passion. Zoe. Everybody say it with passion. Zoe. It is the life of God. The life that is called eternal life. The life that satisfies. This life has permanency. This life can change you through and through. It is very experiential. You can hold it. When the gentleman was talking about his life, I was watching him. He grew up in a good home. And became the worst of men. Tasted everything like Solomon. And his life was coming to an end. But he encountered a life. Shout amen. amen. The Bible says one day an angel went to Cornelius and said. Go to a certain place you meet a certain man called Peter. And he will lead you out of the life you have now. That you may have a life that satisfies. Hallelujah. John chapter 1 verse 4 says, In him, Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. Hallelujah. The meaning of that word light is development, enlightenment, direction. This life which we are talking about that transforms a man has been enshrined in a personality. And the name of that personality is Jesus of Nazareth. The Bible said, for God, for God has given us a testimony. Hallelujah. And that testimony is eternal life. That God has given life into his son. And he who has the son has life. And he who does not have the son does not have life. Shout hallelujah. This is life that satisfies and it is enshrined in the man Jesus Christ. Now is my gospel tonight. Can I preach it? Can I preach it? Can I preach it? The Bible says the Lord God Almighty planted a garden and he put man whom he had formed into that garden. And out of the ground, the Lord God had made every tree to grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. Everybody say the tree of life. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm reading Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 to 9, 15 to 17, and 3, 1 to 4. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to tend it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. Mm. 
Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God in this said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, You may eat of the fruit of the garden. But of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. There were two basic groups of tree in the garden. Number one, there was no commandment attached to that tree. There were other trees in the garden which had laws attached to it. They were forbidden to be eaten. But one amazing thing was that there was also a tree in the garden which is called a tree of life. The commandment said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Now listen. The name of that tree is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everybody say it. The tree was not called good and evil. It was called the knowledge of good and evil. There is a difference between ignorance and innocence. Everybody say innocence. innocence. And everybody say ignorance. ignorance. The world is pushing people to everything. But ignorance is evil. But innocence is divine. Amen. Do not test anything, young man, before it is your time. The Bible says God said the two things there, and he called one the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the one was called the tree of life. Amazingly, the people looked at the tree, which is called life, it has no law attached to it. All they could do is for their own estate, go to where the tree of life is, plug it, and eat it, and they will leave. It was in the garden. There was no law attached to it. It was sitting right there. But he didn't see it. <laughs> Hallelujah! It was there. They didn't see it. Amazing. The stress was that the tree of life was also in the garden. It had no law attached to it, but they could eat it freely, but they did not. Yet the man in the garden chooses the tree of life, and attached to it was its consequences. Listen, is anybody the hearing of my voice tonight will dare to come and take this tree of life, which was in the garden, he will live forever. Amen. No power under the sun can come against you and attack you and defeat you. No power of witchcraft, no principalities of powers, nothing under the sun. I'm preaching. You will talk free and eat free and walk free. Hallelujah. No machinations by any nation or any people can rise up against you and touch you. This tree is a personality. Hallelujah! Amen. And the name of that personality is the name Jesus. Amen. Jesus is that tree of life. John chapter 6 verse 4 and 7, 47 says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the Zoe, the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the desert and they were dead. This is the bread which came from heaven. That one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever 
and ever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. If Jesus comes into your life tonight, you are in for everlasting life. If Jesus comes into your life tonight, if you voluntarily take him and put him into your life, something about you will change. Hallelujah. The unsatisfaction in your life will go and his satisfaction will come. This is the testimony that we have that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in no other man, but this life is in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He who has the son has life. If any man comes into him, shout amen. amen. If any man, the Bible says any man, somebody shout and say any man. Any man. It doesn't matter who that any man is, he's any man. Whether that any man is a black man, is an any man. Whether he's white is an animal, woman is an animal. If any man, if any man does not come to a society, does not just come to church, but if any man comes to this man, Jesus Christ, I'm preaching to people. I'm preaching to people. Hallelujah. I have not been preaching for a long time. Probably about 19 and a half years. I have preached in villages. I have preached in cities. I have preached across borders and frontiers. And I have seen nothing that is so amazing to change but Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. He can take a grasp hold of you and tear your life run right about her and bring meaning and life into your system. And I can feel somebody here tonight who is longing for satisfaction. You have tried everything. You have tried cocaine. You have tried weed. You have tried everything you can name. But I dare you to come and try my Jesus tonight. I'm preaching to people. I'm preaching to people. And if you can dare try this Jesus, if he comes into your life, the pain will go. If he comes into your life, the sickness will go. If he comes into your life, the disease will go. When does this Jesus come? He comes when you are frustrated. He comes when the light in your life is dark. He comes when fear has gripped you. He comes when your house has been given you over. He comes when the doctor said you're going to die. He comes when there is no hope. That is when he comes. He comes when the doors in your life are shut. Hallelujah. When does Jesus Christ of Nazareth come? He comes when you are frustrated. I was preaching in Colombo, Ohio. And in a church room was sitting here a lady with two children and preaching. One of them was sitting here, the other was sitting there weeping. We have gone through all the service, he was still sitting down there. And I asked somebody to ask the lady, why are you sitting the way you are sitting? She said, I have never been to church before. I came to try it the first time. Somebody here came to try it the first time. Something awesome is about to happen to you. Something awesome, something bad in some weariness of you cannot carry. It's about to break up. The power of God is about to come upon your life. You have been to church for a long time. You have not tested power before. Right where you are sitting. Power is coming your avenue. Right in your home, the hearing of my voice. Power is coming to that home. Some people somewhere is about to rise up. Some blind man somewhere is about to be opened. In the name of Jesus. And I said, woman, what are you doing here? She said, my husband has run away, leaving me and my two kids in the house. What is your problem? She said, I have a cancer 
in my last, in my left breast. And the doctor said, I'm going to be operated on, on Friday. My husband has run away and left us in the hope because I am saved. I heard you singing and shouting. I decided to come in here. And then I said, you have come to the right place and the right place. What the doctors cannot do, what physicians cannot do, I brought to you a name that is about every day. He has a life that satisfies. Let our people scream, amen. Your, that is when he comes, when your husband has run away from you. When the doctor said you're going to die. When they have given you five days and six months to leave. That is when he comes. And when he comes, he changes your life. He changes your destiny. He changes your name. He changes your status. Am I talking to somebody? Somebody's status is about to change. Hallelujah! Madam! We don't have a drug, but we have a name. And that name has been given power above every other name. For the Bible said there is no name under the sun given unto man, but which a man must be saved. That whosoever shall mention the name of Jesus, no matter where that person is, you will be saved. Somebody yes, sir, Jesus. Am I preaching to people? Hallelujah. She said, what can I do? I have not been to church before. I said, there's not much to do. Tell somebody beside you, there's not much to do. Push him and tell him, there's not much to do. I look into his eyes and say, what must I do? Number one, acknowledge that you are a sinner. It's not much. Whether you like it or not, you are. Am I talking to people? Yes. Number two, there is somebody sent to take away your sins, the sinless child of God, and his name is Jesus. Yes. If you can acknowledge that one. Number three, if you can out of your heart accept this man into your heart and say today, I have taken you as my Lord and my Savior, something about you will change. And I said, sister, do you believe this? She said, what must I believe? I said, only believe that Jesus is the Son of God and in whom is life. She said, I believe. I believe. Hallelujah. Amen. I said, you are a candidate for deliverance. You are a candidate for satisfaction. Listen, something about you is about to change. Oh, yeah. Whether you say amen or not, it will happen. You've been to church a long time. But watch yourself right now. Power is coming to this place. Function is coming to this place. Amazing power is coming. Something about you is changing. Hallelujah. And the sisters came and said, I believe. I believe. And we held her together and prayed in the name of Jesus. I was living in the pastor's house. The next morning, there was a powerful knock. Powerful knock. The pastor said, the lady we prayed for is standing behind the door. Bring her in. The name of Jesus has done what he has to do. <laughs> and when she came to the room, she knelt down and began to cry uncontrollably. So I said, sister, what is your problem? And she looked into my eyes and said, you said it. What the doctor said, it cannot be done. When I cried that night, that Jesus I did not see in my eyes. Hallelujah. This is life. Am I preaching to people? 
this is life that changes. You may have tried every other. There was no trace of cancer anywhere. Hallelujah. And she said, I better look for my husband. I said, if I were you, I would not look for him. He said, no, I love him so much to lose him. Hallelujah. The next week, I saw two walk into the room. One by the other side. I looked carefully at the woman. And then I said to the pastor, this woman looks like somebody I know. He said, Pastor, you better look carefully. I said, yes, you look like somebody I know, if she can remove her glass. I went close. I said, Sister, you look like somebody I know. He said, you better remember. I am the lady that came here last week. And this is my husband. Your husband was run away from home will come home. This is a life that satisfies. Somebody shout and say, Jesus. Jesus. Somebody shout and say, Jesus. Jesus. Your life is going through stress. But that is the time when he comes. He comes when the doors in your life are shut. He comes when there is darkness in your life. He comes when you are lacking faith and hope. He comes when everybody has run away from you. And you are sitting alone in your home. And when he comes, the Bible said, Jesus has been crucified. And the disciples have locked themselves up in a room and closed the door. And they did not know what to do. Some of them were anticipating, can we go back to our vision? What must we do? But while they were thinking, one of them said, if we dare come out of this place, we are doomed. The Jews are waiting for us. But in the midst of their darkness, one of them said, I used to be a physician. Hallelujah. Amen. And I was standing in the Bible, reading it, listening to them one by one. Oh, yes, when I was I'm reading and signing it in. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then I said to them, go on, brother. One of them said, I used to be a tax collector. A lot of money coming my way. But whilst they were speaking in desperation, all of a sudden, without any provocation, when the door had not been, op had not been opened and the darkness was still hanging there, somebody walked in. And I said to him, who is that? The Bible said, it was my Jesus. Yeah. And he spoke to them and said, peace be unto you. You are living in darkness. Darkness is engulfing you. Peace is coming like a river. Stand up on your feet wherever you are standing. Life is coming your way. Hallelujah. Amen. Tonight, I want to give somebody opportunity to experience this life the first time. And as we are standing on our feet, I will have you to dare anything and start walking out from where you are and coming towards me right now if you are thirsty of this life. You may have been in church and out for a long time, but you have not tasted this life. Today is a day of life. Come quickly. Where you are standing, bless you, my lady. Come quickly. Come quickly. Bless you, my lady. Today is a day of mercy. Today is a day of grace. Bless you, sister. Today is a day of salvation. Come quickly. Bless you, my lady. Bless you, gentlemen. Bless you, sister. Bless you, sister. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Bless you, my lady. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Bless you, sister. Thank you. Wherever you are standing, the hearing of my voice. God is about to do something or something to a life.
is calling you tonight. Jesus is calling you tonight. Just in a little moment we are going to be praying. But he wants to take your life and change it. Wherever you are standing, I still want to give you the opportunity to live forever. To have this life that satisfies. Sometimes you sweat alone in your bed. And you don't know what to do. And you say to yourself, Will I see the dawn of a new day? Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. I want to give you opportunity to live forever, my friend. A military personnel 
a high-ranking officer called me to his office. And then he looked into my eyes and said, is there something else beyond this life? I said, yes, sir. And then he said, if a man dies, will he live again? I said, yes, sir. Then he said, what happens to the man who takes his own life? And I said, you are going to split her right open and get in there. There is nobody who is standing on a fence or standing on the middle ground. You are either in or you are out. You are either going to hell or you are going to heaven. There is no middle ground. Listen, you are either a child of God or you are a child of the devil. Somebody said, I go to church. Churchianity is no Christianity. Somebody said, I have a baptismal card. You will get to be born again. Am I preaching to somebody tonight? Yes. And I said, sir, if you end up your life tonight, you're going to split hell and get in there. He said, get out of my office. He said, I have no finish. Wait for me. The Bible said, all you who are carrying load and are heavy laden, come unto me and I will give you I'm talking to people. And he said, no, my body is so heavy. I can't carry it. You think somebody can let it down for me? He said, that is what I came to tell you today. He said, wait, I'm not ready now. Ah, somebody somewhere better be ready. Come quickly. Bless you, gentlemen. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Our clapping is a sign that his arms are outstretched for you. Bless you, gentlemen. Bless you, gentlemen. Come quickly. Tonight is a night of grace and a night of mercy. I feel a hand reaching out for you, sister. Hallelujah. And then he said, I cannot tell you, bless you, my sisters. I cannot tell you what I have done. I said, I have an ethics whisper into my ears. And then he said, I have killed somebody. And anything can happen to me. It doesn't matter whether you are a murderer or whether you are, you, are, you are destined to be imprisoned. His life knows no limits. Hallelujah. He said, if I come to accept him, will I still be put in prison? I said, you'll be there, but you have eternal life for your soul. Am I preaching? Am I preaching to people? But I lost that soul. I walked out of his office a few moments. I heard he was lost. And when they found him, he hung himself on a tree. But you have an opportunity tonight. I said, you have an opportunity tonight. I'm going to talk a long time stand until we start praying. Because we came to redeem souls. We were sitting at our prayer meeting when this young man drove in in an old car called 160 J. That's it. So those of you Ghanaians, you don't know what it looks like. Except we are Gold Coast man. I'm preaching to people. You know what that thing is? You only know Rolls Royce. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Power is in this house. Yeah. Unction, I can feel it. 
Some of you are being anointed tonight. I can feel it here on the platform. For an onset and a service, a hand is going to touch you shortly. And you are going to be changed and be turned into another man. I'm preaching to people here. And the man said, can I speak to you folks? So I come to our office and he sat down. He had two lots of things. One is a buta. You know what a buta is? The one, uh, that's it. And another one is, is a bag called my yeah, yeah. You don't know what it is like. And there was money in that bag. Amen. 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 And then he said, this thing in this bag is a strange thing. That is the thing that gives me money. And I sacrificed my first wife for it. Some of you think the second wife you have had started today. It started long ago. When we say some of these things in this place, everybody goes like, ha. Ah. Hello? That's the truth. But he said, they gave me eight years to live. And here is the thing. And this is money. Please, take this money and destroy it for me. I look at the thing I said to him, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If a man gains the whole world and loses his soul, what can a man give? Too many people are valuing many things more than their souls. But tonight is an opportunity. Shout amen. amen. In two minutes, I'm going to be praying for these people. Come quickly. And then he said, what should I do? He said, if this money had helped you, you wouldn't bring it here. And then he said, well, if I take this thing and I take your Jesus, what will happen to me? I said, you're going to get more broke than you used to be. He said, hold it. I'm going to tell my wife and come back. He was only driving from where we were to Takwa. It was 13 kilometers. He didn't get back to Takwa. He didn't crash with any car. The car he was sitting in together with everything tumbled. And he didn't come back. Opportunities come but once. Tonight is an opportunity. Bless you all of you standing here. Is there any more person coming? Come quickly before we pray. Come quickly. Number one. Come quickly. Number two. I'm counting up to seven. Come quickly. Number three. Number four. Number five. I have two more to count. Come. 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 Number six. I'm counting the last one. Number seven. Give your life, give a clap off into the field. Now all of you standing in front of me, lift up your two hands. And say this, I'm saying after me, Father in heaven, I come before you tonight in the name of Jesus. I have heard that you alone is a life giver. And you give life to whomsoever comes to you. Today, I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. I will walk with you all the days of my life. Please come into my life and change it in Jesus' name. This is life. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, wherever you are standing, get a hold of your brother. You'll be standing where you are, wherever you are right now. Are you ready? Quickly.